The lats can actually insert very, very low. Right. But you see a lot of guys, they only have it very up top. Okay, so Phil Heath probably does not have a master's in kinesiology. He's probably not studied anatomy. Coach Greg and Shannon Sharp, a bodybuilder? Who are we kidding here? Well, Phil Heath put Shannon Sharp through a workout and we're gonna watch the video comment. What is he saying that makes sense? What makes no sense? If you wanna learn how to train from Phil Heath, Shannon Sharp, this is the video for you. We're not gonna go crazy wide, but we're gonna be about right here, okay? We're gonna stay here and then keep that chin up to the top of our chest, okay? And so my personal opinion is you don't need to pull the bar down to the top of your chest. Not everyone has that kind of flexibility. And if you can pull it down, oftentimes it means you're lifting a pussy weight. That's right, you heard me. If you can pull the weight down, no problem, all the way to your chest, maybe the weight is just too light. When I'm lifting heavy, training harder than last time, I can't pull the bar down. I'm not doing muscle ups when I'm doing a lat pull down. Just because the bar doesn't touch your chest does not mean you're not doing an effective lat pull down. We wanna make sure that we're pulling not with our hands, not with our biceps and right. our forearms, but with our elbows. And so a great tip is to pull down with your elbows. Oftentimes people are using their biceps too much. And so when you're thinking about doing a lat pull down, concentrate on bringing the elbows down. Whether or not that touches the top of your chest, it's okay. If you're getting a good stretch at the top and squeeze at the bottom, even if the bar is only this low, you're fine. Notice, even in this position, I have a great squeeze in my lats. It's literally getting hard to pull even lower. And notice, I have no weight. The bar is in line with the top of my traps. And so for me to pull the bar to my chest, I just can't do it effectively. The further they can go, the better the squeeze is gonna be. Okay on these lats, okay? And notice we have a 250 pound, five foot nine Hercules of a man, and he's using about 40 pounds. And so, yeah, he's pulling it down to the chest. But if we were training hard, we had a heavy weight on the bar, we're trying to really work it, we're not pulling the bar with that kind of perfect technique. And it's gonna eliminate a lot of the soreness that you're gonna have here. For him. Yeah, because everybody wants to grip everything so right. much because they look at the weight and they're like, I gotta have. And so if your grip is affecting you, you can in fact use straps. Shannon Sharp himself uses straps. If you can't push as hard as you want because your grip is fatigued, then use straps. If your grip is not a hindrance to you going harder than last time, then it's perfectly okay to not use straps. Cool, good, good. And then you wanna slow it down just a little bit. There we go. It's not a race. So many people, they just try to lift the weight as fast as they can. Explode this, explode that. Quick up, quick down. That is not how you lift. The focus should be on tut, time under tension. And so you want to go slower on the eccentric than on the concentric, preferably at a two to one pace, as in two seconds up, one second down. If you can do that, you're going to guarantee an increased time under tension and more muscle growth will occur. Add to that a squeeze, a pause at the hardest position, which on the lat pull down, clear it at the bottom. Easy to hold it at the top, but at the bottom, you want a tight squeeze, pause, hold the weight. That increases tut, and you're holding the contraction at the hardest part of the movement, making it that much harder, and it will guarantee to stimulate muscle growth. You see all the pictures of Mr. Olympia, all this other stuff. You see they everybody be doing that, that They've been doing that at boutique gyms also. Yeah. <laughs> They've been watching those videos. They, right. They're hopped up on the supplements. And so if you're hopped up on supplements, for example, pre-workout 2.0, and you find that giving you too much energy and you don't want that, then of course take pre-pump. It's stim free. That means you can go and work out in the evening, get a great pump full of L-citrulline, beta-alanine and other important ingredients, and you can get the most effective workout possible. And so there's nothing wrong with being hopped up on supplements. I love the feeling of taking a pre-workout with stim, but if you're not looking for that, be sure to consider pre-workout pump. It's stim free. And then we want more time under tension. And I just can't get over the weight. It's Phil Heath. He's doing a double underhand pull down. He's got 50 pounds. Like, how are you building that much muscle with 50 pounds? Clearly, Phil Heath, seven time Mr. Olympia, he's got amazing genetics. But if you walk in the gym, train hot ass, never make a grimace, never strain, never struggle, always stop five reps from failure, you're not gonna look like friggin' Phil Heath. And so what happens is people that do amazingly well at something, they overemphasize how much they think it's because of what they're doing. And so Phil Heath looks incredible. Who's gonna debate that? And so he assumes, well, it's probably because I train better than everyone else. That may be the case, but it also might be he has way better genetics than the rest of us. And so in my opinion, you need to train harder than this. You can't just train what looks to be half-ass. 
If you're never pushing yourself to failure and or beyond, and you're beyond an intermediate lifter, you're holding yourself back. Now, if you're a beginner and you're just joining the gym, this is great advice. I would highly recommend you train like this. Don't go to failure, use perfect form. But if you're an advanced lifter and you're not going to failure, not pushing the envelope a bit, what are you even doing? Do you even actually lift? Why would I do underhand lat pull downs? Because we want to work on the sweeping of the lats. Okay. The lats can actually insert very, very low. Right. But you see a lot of guys, they only have it very up top. Uh -huh. Okay, so Phil Heath probably does not have a master's in kinesiology. He's probably not studied anatomy. And yes, it's true what he's saying. Some guys' lats, they insert really low, and some they insert higher. But you can't affect where the insertion occurs based on how you perform the exercise. You can't just say, I'm going to pull underhand and my lats will insert lower. Where it inserts is where it inserts. Think of it. Chris Bumstead's biceps insert very short. He could add inches of arm size, but never have a full and round bicep. I don't care how many twists, supinations, preacher curls, he can do anything and he will never lower the insertion of the bicep. The same applies for your lats. You can't pull a certain way and think that suddenly your lats are going to insert lower. And so he probably never studied this. He doesn't know. And so he's assuming you can build your lower lats more by grabbing a certain way. Well, they can get bigger, but they can insert lower. Let's go over here and do some tricep real okay. quick. And so one thing I'd like to point out is there's nothing wrong with doing the one arm tricep extension. However, for me, I just don't feel it. I can't push hard when I'm using a supinated grip. A supinated grip is when you have your hand like this and you can hold a cup of soup. Think of it like that. Cup of soup, you're holding the cup of soup. Pronate is when your hand's on top. If you're doing a one-arm tricep extension with a supinated grip, you're grabbing the handle like this and you have to pull back. To me, I can't pull hard. My grip, it feels awkward. I'm grabbing the handle from behind and I have to extend outwards. I don't feel I can get a very strong contraction. Another thing, I hate doing unilateral movements. I hate having to do one arm and then the other. You're doing your right arm for 40 seconds, then your left arm for 40 seconds, and then you have to go back to the right arm after only a 50 second break. And so technically you're pushing for a minute and 20. I'd rather do both arms at the same time. So when I'm doing exercise, if at all possible, I'm always trying to do it so that I can do both arms, both simultaneously. To me, that makes more sense. It's more time effective. And if you push the right arm first, you're probably going to be slightly mentally and physically exhausted. Think of it. You're concentrating on going harder than the last time on one arm. Your heart rate's getting elevated. Then you switch to the other side. You're already mentally fatigued. You've just pushed yourself that hard. You then switch over to the other side. Your heart rate's already up and you have to go again to failure. And so whatever arm you're doing first is the arm that's going to get the more effective workout. And so if you do enjoy unilateral movements, my suggestion, always start with the weak arm first. That's when you're more motivated. You have more energy. You'll be able to push harder. That way, if you do slack off on the second arm, it won't matter so much as it's already your dominant side. When you're doing this, is your goal always to stimulate, not a matter? And so stimulate, don't annihilate. And so that is great advice. However, you do need to train harder than last time. And they're doing, let's say, bicep curls. Right. And you almost want to ask them, are you doing shoulders or back? Because they're going like this. Right. And so Phil Heath says, well, you shouldn't look like you're cheating all your reps. You shouldn't be swinging the bar. You should look like you're doing the exercise you're supposed to. And that is true but there's nothing wrong with doing a few cheat reps. For example, you're doing strict bicep curls. You get to rep number eight, you can no longer do it. Do you simply put the bar down or do you swing and cheat a little? You cheat a little bit, you can get two, three, maybe even four more reps. I'm not talking about doing the limbo, I'm talking about a little body English. Arnold Schwarzenegger, he used to do cheat curls. Cheat on your curls, not on your girls, right? How long does a typical workout take you to complete? I want to make sure I can do it in 75 minutes. That means I'm not over here, you know. But you're not bull jabbing around. You That's got what I'm saying. I'm on. in there. I'm locked yeah, in. Right. My advice, if you like being in the gym, it's fun for you. You want to rest longer than 90 seconds between sets. Well, go for it. You want to be there for two, even three hours, and it's fun for you? Well, be my guest. What else would you be doing? Sitting at home watching TV, maybe drinking beer at the bar? And so why not go to the gym? Two, three hours, do some cardio, perhaps 30 minutes. Lift weights, do cardio, hang out, chat, meet with your friends. 
There's nothing wrong with going to the gym and making it a social atmosphere. Yes, we're there to train, but it is fun to talk to your friends, meet other people, and socialize. If you're like me, you sit in a room like this all day, and you watch videos, and so when you go to the gym, it's fun. You actually meet people. You can speak to adults with similar interests. And so I don't personally believe you should be in and out of the gym. I'm in the gym, headphones down, and I don't look at anyone, and it's 60 minutes and I'm gone out of the gym. To me, that's people that don't really like the gym. Perhaps you do. Some do. But if you really love the gym, do you really want to get it over with in under an hour? I have no problem being at the gym for two hours. I'll ride the bike 30 minutes and warm up and I'll take my time. I'll rest a bit longer. I don't want to jump from one machine to the next and only rest 30 seconds. I'd rather rest one or two minutes. And so what's most important is make the gym fun. If you enjoy it, you're going to keep doing it. And whatever you need to do to make it fun, do that. Look, my heaviest lift ever was uh, 505 on the bench for a single. That's enough. Right. I can brag about that till I die. You right. know what I mean? Right. You know, I'm in that 1500 club. I've done it all. Right. I've done that. And so Phil Heath says a lot of people watch him and say, you always have reps left in the tank. He's like, yeah, I just don't need to train that hard. And if you're not training that hard, you can make up for it with more volume. And so Phil Heath has amazing mind-muscle connection, also amazing genetics, and so he gets away with not training his heart. Also consider, he's downsized 30 pounds. And so although he says he weighs between 245 and 255, the guy could easily put on 30 more pounds of muscle if he wanted to. But he's in this for the long haul, he wants to be an athlete, he talks about wanting to run 5Ks, he had a 40-inch vertical jump when he was a basketball player, and he says he's part of the 1,500-pound club. And what does that mean? He says he benched over 500, squatted over 500, and so deadlifted over 500. And so 1,500 pounds for the three lifts, it's not bad side, but for Phil Heath, if he really were eagle lifting, I have no doubt the guy could have pushed 2,000 pounds. Look at this guy, 500-pound squat, you'd assume he'd 700. And what about deadlifts? I would assume he could do well over 700 pounds if he in fact wanted to. But guess what? He didn't. And he's 42 years of age. He's in amazing shape. He's not injured. And so training in this fashion, well, it's allowed him to have longevity. Remember, he won the Mr. Olympia seven times. He won it so often, people eventually said, we want to see him lose. We're sick of him winning all the time. Chris Bumstead only just beginning to understand what this means. He's already three-peated. He's going for Mr. Olympia number four right now. And it's the first time he's had to go through those mental struggles of people writing comments and saying, are are you going to be in shape? Are you going to win? People are hot on your heels. Can you still do it? And so it's hard to argue against Phil Heath because he walks the walk and talks the talk. And I'm just Coach Greg. I agree with a lot of what he's saying, but I do personally believe that most people should train harder than Phil. His form is impeccable. He knows what he's doing. But I do think that if you're at this level, you're an advanced trainer, you need to train harder than this to maximize your genetic potential. I want to come here. I feel that stretch in the lats, which right. is good. And I'm going to squeeze. And on seated rows, Phil Heath really believes in getting a good stretch at the bottom, stretch out the lats, really feel it, and pull just a vertical. Oftentimes, people are swinging back and forth. They look like a pendulum. Back and forth, leaning way back and way forward, cheating the whole time. They're using way too much biceps. And so what he says is get a good stretch forward, stretch the lats out, come to vertical, and really squeeze the lats hard. If you can pause it there, pause it, and repeat. Do that until failure. My advice, do exactly as he's doing, but once you can't do it in strict form anymore, then add a little bit of swing. There's nothing wrong with adding a bit of cheat to this to allow yourself to train harder than last time. Looking for harder than last time supplements like protein powder, pre-workout, G-Stim, G-Shred, G-Focus, G-Test, 3-Test, the list goes on and on. Use code GREG, 10% off. Also, GO2 Max, the pre-order's in. Please get that before it sells out. Subscribe, click the bell button, like the video if you liked it. Did you subscribe? Do it now. Watch one of the boobs. Follow me on Instagram, Greg Doucette, IP Pro. Remember, I do cameos, phone consults, coaching plans by me and my team. Message for details. And until next time, I am out.